Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. My name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC. Uh, before we get started today, I would like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSIAC webinar announcement. You can go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. Also put a link to that in the chat. Uh, when you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view the webinar slides, click here. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat window on the lower right hand side of the webinar screen. Uh, you can use that to chat with each other and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. Uh, however, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, uh, please click the icon with three dots icons labeled more slash panel options to bring up the Q&A window as part of your layout. At the end of the presentation, I will go over the Q&A. Uh, for the benefit of those on the phone, I'll read the questions out loud to the presenter. Uh, if you have a technical issue during the presentation, have no fear, the full presentation will be available online. Please check back to the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the GoToWebinar button will take you uh, to the YouTube link. Uh, with that said, I will uh, introduce today's presenter. Uh, first, we have Ms. Sarah Standard. Uh, Sarah Standard is a 1988 U.S. Naval Academy graduate and a retired Navy captain, retiring in 2013. In 2014, she began working for Avion LLC, where she developed and instructed NAVAIR specific cyber warfare course for the NAVAIR acquisition workforce, teaching over 3,000 in the first offering of the course. In 2016, she transitioned to serve as the Cybersecurity Interoperability Technical Director to now the executive director for developmental test evaluation and assessments in the office of the undersecretary of defense for research and engineering. We also have Nilo Thomas. Nilo graduated from New Mexico State University in 2013 with a BS in aerospace engineering. He worked for the Air Force 47 Cyberspace Test Squadron for eight years where he was a test manager leading the largest test programs in the test squadron, unified platform and joint cyber command and control the DOD's premier cyberspace weapon systems. In 2021, he started working for dot and &E, and he works as the organization's software and cyber advisor, managing the diverse portfolio of dot and &E software and cyber initiatives on behalf of operational test and evaluation. With that said, we'll get started with today's webinar. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, I guess. I don't even know where we are. It is morning for some of you maybe and afternoon for others, so both apply. Um, I'm Sarah Standard and Nilo and I are gonna tag team throughout this presentation. It will go fast. We have a very technically dense presentation, but we will not cover it in the depth that is on the slides. We have two primary topics to cover today. And those are 
an overview, quick overview of DOD test and evaluation policy and guidance updates, and then we will deep dive into cyber t &E policy and guidance. Please uh, let us know if you have questions and we will take turns monitoring in chat to see what, if, we, if we can answer any questions on the fly. All right, so, Neela, over right. to you. Yes, yes, so, so this is the policy update. dot &E and DTNA uh, published uh, an enterprise teeny guidebook in 2022 here um, to support our test and evaluation documentation DODI 5089. Um, and what this what DODI 5089 is is our test evaluation documentation uh, at the policy level for what is expected from DT and OT. We are currently revising this document, and we are revising this document to meet the needs of various other documents. Uh, other manuals that we are writing in the department. DOT and E has written various memorandums over its uh, rich and storied history, and we are trying to consolidate these memorandums into uh, several smaller DODMs. We are working jointly with DTE and A to write these manuals. The one that we're going to focus on today is the uh, DODM 5000 XC Cyber TNE, but you can see that there are other ones here, like the Temp TES uh, DOTM, the Software TNE DOTM testing in um, EM, EMSO, EMSO environments or, and testing in mod, uh, for modeling and simulation. We, these DODMs will also have supporting guidance, uh, companion guides over here on the far right that'll kind of explain how to do the testing that the manuals require. So uh, if you're familiar with DO, the DOD's um, cybersecurity guidebook 2.1 that came out in 2020, um, we are, updating that manual to now flow with the cyber dotum and, uh, and and partner with it to explain the how of, of what is required in that cyber DODM. So with that, that's kind of where we're going with DOD pol T &E policy at, at a high level. So there's there's these so again there's 5089 that's the large T &E overarching policy. Then there are there are DODMs that are underneath that kind of subset into specific domains of T and E that are that are unique to that highlight unique challenges within the department uh, that warranted uh, additional policy. Then there's an enterprise T and E guidebook that focuses on um, on the acquisition pathways themselves. And then finally there are companion guides that talk about the DODMs, uh, the, the details on the DODMs. So all again and lastly all of that is co-op co-authored. All right, go ahead, Sarah. All right, thank you, Nilo. So in the DOD manual, the approach being co-developed between our two organization is to supplement what's in the DODI 5089, which is also under revision. So that, oh, that new DODI 5089 will be very different from what you have today published. You can see several themes here that we're focusing on, focusing on trying to make sure that our systems are being delivered to be resilient is essentially what it comes down to and using t and &E to verify and validate that aspect. Um, the manual will support the adaptive acquisition framework and um, then on the companion guide, I'm on slide four for those of you who are following along at home, the companion guide is that how-to for cyber and it does replace, as Nilo indicated, the current DOD Cybersecurity T&E Guidebook version 2.1. You will notice we have a change in terminology. We're dropping cybersecurity and we're moving to cyber to be more inclusive of all aspects of the threat space and all concerns that we have in terms of defending against that threat. So there is an increased emphasis on iterative testing, continuous, if you're using automated in particular, ad, being agile, um, being able to focus on the recover capabilities, the resilience capabilities, and your cyber survivability capabilities. So for those of you that joined a couple months ago, you heard the cyber survivability endorsement presentation by Steve Pitcher. And then last month, you would have heard from the system security engineering uh, cyber guide from uh, Crow's office. And so Kate, that was Katie. So we are piggybacking on top of those two prior presentations. And uh, hopefully, we'll be able to link that in for you today. A big part of what we want to focus on is the contractor's role and being able to have better integration of the contractor and government testing. And then always considering the operational mission, regardless of whether you're doing operational testing 
or you're doing developmental testing. So shifting left, starting early, and iterating is kind of the theme. All right, Nilo. Okay, Sarah, you're gonna have to click for me, but this is yep. a visual representation of our key concepts for cyber T&E. Um, these concepts enable iterative cyber T&E, and they're not tied to any specific acquisition pathway, uh, but they are tied to the decisions within those acquisition pathways. So don't think of this as a timeline, think of this more as a uh, concept mapping, if you will. Um, so this first, this first click here uh, is that the program needs to establish a cyber working group as early as possible, uh, which inherits roles and responsibilities and key organizations from the t and &E Working Integrated Pro Project Team as it uh, pertains to developing and updating the cyber t and &E strategy. You can see what there's expectations of, of maintaining and updating that cyber t and &E strategy is here on the, the left. Um, the working group identifies representatives from the lead developmental test organization and the operational test agency, um, and they're each responsible for ensuring that test satisfies DT and OT objectives. Um, go ahead and click, Sarah. Okay, the cyber t &E strategy needs to be integrated into the overarching strategy here. Uh, and, the, and the way to do that is to by using what we call the integrated decision support key, that green box underneath our temp T and E strategy. Um, these green kind of arrows that are flowing off of there is kind of like an extension of the IDSK. It's explaining how the IDSK would map support uh, uh, map program decisions. So these stars, for example, on the major capability acquisition, these could be milestone A, B, C, IOC, FOC, um, and it's mapping to RNF. RMF programmatic decisions like the ATO process. Um, and it's also mapping down to different tiers of testing, if you will, subcomponent testing, component testing, subsystem system, and all the way up to system of system level testing. And the idea with the IDSK is that you're mapping the data that you need with the decisions that you're that that you need to support. And your T and E is bringing that data in time for decision making at any step of the process. Okay, um, so when we develop that strategy, we need to prioritize and scope our testing throughout the continuum of, of the life cycle. And the, the way the cyber working group does that is through these three activities down here in the bottom, this bottom gray bar here. We uh, identify the attack surface. We identify the threats that are going to be representative of our system, against our system, and we conduct mission-based cyber risk assessments. Um, so, go ahead, Sarah, yeah. Testing needs to be performed iteratively on these components. What the gray bars, the gray bar down there is doing is finding out where the most critical components of testing is and, um, and scoping our testing because we cannot test everywhere and everything. So we have to test, focus fire our testing on the critical components. Here you can see we've got five different types of testing. Um, that we will dive deeper into uh, throughout the slide deck, but there's there's um, cyber OT and E, cyber live fire, cyber DT, contractor uh, T and E, and integrated contractor government T and E. Um, again, these test events, depending on your program, will be capturing different points captured in different points of the program. Uh, and then, lastly, there's security verification tests, which we will also cover briefly. Go ahead, Sarah. All of this information needs to flow into uh, databases held at the appropriate classification level. And the idea is uh, that this data is accessible to all stakeholders. Go ahead, Sarah. And then the last thing is that all of this information, if it's in an accessible place, allows um, organizations like the program offices, the LDTO, the OTA, and the um, other, uh, you know, the oversight organizations like usdr &E and and dot and &E to write reports at any moment in time to also support decision making. Go ahead, Sarah. So you're probably familiar with the six phases that were in the previous guidebook. So if we show that we can, I, we have a mapping here of how those six phases map to this diagram. So go ahead, Sarah, click on the first one. So 
Understanding the cybersecurity requirements was phase one in the old six phase process. And basically you're, you're always doing that in our process, right? You really should have done, been doing that always in the other process as well. But the term phase might have implied that there is a timing aspect to it that you do early and then you don't really do it anymore. Um, so here we're trying to make sure that you're constantly going back to make sure that you understand the cyber requirements and you're probably doing that uh, you know, in time for, if you click Sarah, phase two, you're doing that in time to characterize your attack surface. So every time you need to recharacterize your attack surface, as you can see, we kind of have that occurring multiple times throughout this process. You would also want to pre-game yourself by understanding if cyber requirements have changed from then to now. Um, go ahead, Sarah. So phases three and four were our DT events cooperative vulnerability identification and ident uh, adversarial cybersecurity dt and e these the terms cooperative and adversarial have been pulled out of the uh, out of the dotum so we will mention those a few times maybe to help cross communicate but overarchingly those terms are gone from our guidance we can you, the de the department can still use that terminology but it's just not in our policy anymore um, Either way though, these those test events that DT were expected to conduct are still here. They're just con considered government cyber DT and E. Well, they're also contractor. So and contractor, oh. yes. Yes. Go ahead, Sarah. And then five and six, the were the cooperative vulnerability penetration assessment and the adversarial assessment. These were more o uh, operational test events. You can see that. They're still kind of captured down here as test events, as the arrows, and then the assessment parts are captured as reports because the uh, adversarial assessment and the cooperative vulnerability penetration assessment should be grabbing data from many test events to roll up into an assessment of uh, cyber mission effects on the system. Go ahead, Sarah. I guess this is you, this is you right, Sarah? Sorry, I thought I was on mute. Yeah, I had to put <laughs> it's playing the back and forth game there. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna we're gonna dive into some of the details, the technical details. So we're looking now at that integrated decision support key. What do we mean by that? Okay, so the integrated decision support key supports those decisions, all of the decisions, and the what we mean by they're complementary and independent. The testing is not part of risk management framework and risk but risk management framework and tests should inform each other that's what we mean by there there was a question in chat that's what we mean by they are in, uh, independent of each other the dod cio owns the rmf process uh, ous drne and dot &E own the tne processes so there's different uh, policy owners and the processes should be complementary, very much so. So you should be planning those things to happen together. All right, so the cyber working group who leads the program cyber T&E uh, strategy development, they are responsible for ensuring they provide input into that IDSK. That cyber T&E strategy must be integrated with the program's T&E strategy. You have to plan all those different types of tests that Nila was, was highlighting and those accessible data databases have to enable that re the reuse or those repositories of data should enable the reuse of that data across any uh, decision maker who needs that. So the IDSK is a program managed document that allows the program to schedule their testing to inform the decisions of interest and they can be you know with what with each pathway they can be varied what those decisions will be. But the IDSK helps to determine what tests do I need to do to generate the data that will help answer the questions that inform the decisions? So it's a it's a building block approach, if you will. And so each you have to have this data for every, in order to have this uh, decision making. And so you you want to focus on where am I going to get that data? Who's going to be doing it? Who, what do I need in place? And that helps you write your your test and evaluation strategy, as well as building this overarching IDSK. So on the left side here is the building of the IDSK, doing the planning, writing your T&E strategy. On the right side is the execution piece where the data actually gets generated. Okay, so what I want you to focus on is the center section here. So the program manager has decisions that have to be made. Should I move forward? Should I accept what the contractor has delivered? Should I 
move into operational tests. Those can be examples of decisions. In order to have those decisions, they have to define what they have to evaluate. And in order to know what you want to evaluate, you have to define the test events, the experiments, the modeling and simulation events that you need to generate the data. And then those test events, experiments, and MS events define the resources that are required by the program, which then drives scheduling to inform the decisions. So your schedule, when you execute your schedule, it will generate, you, you will be doing these test events, which will generate that data, which will inform those decisions. So what you're documenting in your T&E strategy is the plan. What you're doing when you execute is collecting the data to inform the decisions. Hopefully that's clear. Uh, we want both operational and technical information captured in the IDSK with operational capabilities and technical capabilities being able to be evaluated. So here's a notional idea of what we mean by an IDSK. This is by no way prescriptive. You can do it any way you want. This is just trying to help people understand what we mean in the cyber area, the cyber attributes with, within an IDSK. So again, there's an operational capability or evaluation on the operational side, and there's technical capabilities to evaluate on the technical side. And so you might have something like focus on operational mission effects or system data security risk management pieces. So confidentiality, integrity, availability, there's your RMF integrated with test, right? And then on the cyber survivability side, there is uh, mission critical capabilities that have to be evaluated with real operators and defenders involved as well. But in the system focus, you'll have the prevent, mitigate, recover, and adapt within the system focus that you should be testing on in, in developmental testing. So you can see there's overlap, potential for overlap. So what will happen is the IDSK will help illuminate opportunities to do integrated testing. What, so when you have contractor testing and you have government testing wanting to gather similar data, then you can do an integrated contractor government DT type event. If you have opportunities during um, develop, government developmental tests where operational tests can also use the same data to inform their uh, evaluation areas, then again, you have another opportunity for integrated government DTOT. So that's the intent behind the IDSK. There are other types of integrated testing, or there are three, three major types, I guess, of integrated testing that we think exist in uh, that you can consider. So I already mentioned the contractor government integrated testing, and I already mentioned the integrated government DTOT. What I did not mention was the integrated functional cyber testing. So when you are doing testing for your key performance parameters, your whatever, your, measure, your measures of effectiveness, measures of performance, then you have an opportunity to add cyber into those test events if you plan it, right, obviously. So that's the idea behind the integrated functional cyber testing it's in the current cyber t &E guidebook. So we do talk about it briefly, but we're trying to elevate that a little bit more as well. Um, the draft IDSK is available for use if you want it. Uh, that's just the cyber portion though, so it's, it's bigger than that. Um, all right, so let's focus on the cyber, this is still me, right? Yeah, cyber working group activities for scoping the cyber t &E. So I'm gonna focus on the cyber requirements, which again, goes back to joint staff cyber survivability attributes, the threat characterization piece, the attack surface characterization, mission-based cyber risk assessments, and using cyber t &E. So three of those are in that gray bar in the diagram. The other two are, or the other, yeah, the other two are, um, built into the, the policy and the guidance. So it's important for the cyber working group to understand the requirements that are in place for that system, whether they be cyber survivability, cybersecurity, or whatever they wanna call them, doesn't really matter. So the cyber working group, unless it's a merged uh, working group with the system security engineers and the and the cyber testers and all that in one big happy group, that's perfectly fine. You can do it that way. But if not, then it, they should be supporting the system security engineers to define the performance specification and an actual design that accounts for mission risk and be, is implementing testable, measurable, prevent, mitigate, recover, and adapt capabilities. So we advocate following the joint staff cyber survivability endorsement, even if you're not a joint system. And it's really important that the engineers develop metrics. So having the testers at the table with the system security engineers can help 
emphasize that metric piece and the measurement piece and how are we really going to test this. It also helps because they come with a think like a hacker kind of perspective, the testers do. So they come representing the threat, if you will. It's like having the threat at your table saying, don't do that because I'm going to do this. So it's it's helpful to have this, this integration. And this activity in our DOD manual is request, you know, we say you should repeat this for each acquisition and IDSK decision. So there, these are the 10 cyber survivability attributes. Um, and when it comes to the resilience piece, I believe CSA 7, 8, 9, and 10 help you get to the resilience piece, whereas the pre prevent piece is very important. You also want to focus on that resilience. As written, oftentimes they don't, they aren't directly obvious how they're measurable, but if you start to think about how long is it taking me to manage my system performance if it's degraded by a cyber event, then you can get a measurable requirement out of that. How long does it take me to recover my system capabilities? How long does it take me to detect anomalies? How long does it take me to, to harden my cyber attack surface on a recurring basis? How long does it take me to patch my system? Those kinds of things can get you to measurable requirements. On the engineering side, so now I'm pivoting over to Katie Watmore's presentation. The CSAs are very high level requirements and engineers have to have lower level measurable requirements in order to have an ability to say, yes, we're on track to achieving that cyber survivability attribute. So the performance specification has to articulate those cyber survivability attributes as actual requirements. And they then the contractor has to take that performance specification and do the decomposition into the lower levels of the system and define the actual ways they're going to measure and demonstrate as they're building the system that they're on track to achieving that system survivability key performance parameter with a cyber survivability endorsement. It's uh, often not done. I am all the time not done, maybe, today. So uh, it, I think it's an important aspect that we need to get better at doing and we need to get better at asking our contractors to help us with that. So when it comes to getting that mission and threat context, we use mission-based cyber risk assessments. So I'm going to be getting to those here shortly. But in terms of reusing testing results, when you when you do these iterative activities here, the threat assessment and the attack surface characterization and the mission-based cyber risk assessments, you take those testing results, then you can really get to an affordable way to do the cyber testing that we're advocating so that you aren't trying to test everything in the world because you can't. You scope to the critical cyber ter terrain that you care about, right? So you need to do, you need to focus on what is the threat capable of? What do we think the threat might be capable of? I know that's impossible, but you have to use the intelligence products that you get and then take a look at where is the critical components inside of your system? Where is the critical functionality inside of your system? And how might an attacker gain access and exploit anything in there? And what might they be trying to do? So mission-based cyber risk assessments can help you do that kind of analysis, taking the current threat information and your attack surface, knowing what you interface with and all those parts and pieces within your system and be able to study them from a mission-based perspective. So the threat characterization piece, we've, uh, we've asked some, for some help from the Intel community, and they built this uh, understanding of how the intelligence community works to put into our companion guide. So this uh, picture will be roughly described in the companion guide. It's not, it's not the cyber working group's job to get the threat intel. It's, making sure that they have the threat intel and how understanding how threat intel is generated is important for the cyber working group to understand where they can expect to see results coming out of that. So again, this, is, this has to be repeated for each acquisition and IDSK decision. If you look at that attack surface, this is just a fun picture to look at. You know, it's, there's a lot of stuff out there that our systems might be dependent upon, including critical infrastructure including the training devices, including the maintenance devices and, and the supply chain and the, the repair facilities, there's, there's just a bunch out there. So all the different ways that an adversary might be able to get to the system or get information out about your system. And so our, our contractor, our defense industrial base is a big uh, partner in this attack surface space. And so you have to 
consider them as well. We have in the DOD manual a table that describes some evolving attack surface elements that we wanted to highlight to draw particular attention to. So we will focus on these, uh, the how to look at some of these in the companion guide. The DOD manual just highlights them as with some considerations for what you should be thinking about in terms of testing in these, uh, with respect to these different attack surface elements. So this is a modification of the famous wheel of doom or wheel of death or wheel of access that the Air Force originally created. Um, for this version, I, this is the version that I published in the cyber tabletop guide for DOD. You notice I've added critical infrastructure. The system is dependent upon critical infrastructure. And I've also added the development and test environments, processes and tools to this because everything in here has a development and test environment process and tool, even if it's a COTS product. So you have to think about all of that when you are thinking about where is my crit, where is my key cyber terrain for my system. And so the attack surface characterization can be separate from the MBCRA. It should precede the MBCRA or it can be a standalone. Um, so, or it can be as part of your MBCRA, your mission-based cyber risk assessment. And it, you should be working with the program protection team in these cases. So all the entry points, exit points, and you know, all that stuff, you look at that in your attack surface characterization. You, you get that mission decomposition from program protection team. Now, if they haven't done it, that is an indicator you need to do that. And this again is for each acquisition and IDSK decision, you should have current data on your attack surface. Um, yeah, I think that's it on this slide. So where do mission-based cyber risk assessments fit in the systems engineering process model? Which I think I grabbed this from DAU, this picture. So you see at the top here, what comes in is the requirements, uh, the cyber survivability attributes one through 10. And there is a, a process by which a requirements analysis is performed. That requirements analysis process generates the performance specification, which goes into the functional analysis and allocation. And there's re feedback loops everywhere, as you can see. The, the, uh, the technical performance measures become part of that systems analysis and control effort that has to be done, a management process, right? And then ultimately, you're gonna get some sort of a design out of this. And that design has to go through a verification process. That's where T&E comes in. In the early stages, your mission-based cyber risk assessment should be informing your requirements, your engineering, and your testing that you need to do. So that's where it fits. Um, they are used to inform con concept selection. They can be used to inform your design before you lock that down. They can be used to track your system progress what the government gets from the contractor, you should do an MBCRA there. And, and when it's in operations, you should be looking at what, am I still resilient to my system in, in the, my current threat environment? So minimum of inputs, uh, latest system details, and you can see all those here, current threat characterization, a listing and analysis of existing known vulnerabilities. So if you have a bill of material, great, because that will be very useful here. What you produce from the mission-based cyber risk assessment are estimates of mission impact using input from your operational users, your defenders, your maintainers, engineers, the developers, and you get an attack surface characterization, and you also get um, an attack path analysis out of this. And the reports will have uh, scenarios of those attack paths and those threat vignettes, which can inform testing and should inform testing. So our companion guide will have much more detail than this. So on using test results in particular, it's important as part of this engineering process in that verification step that your contractor is doing a T&E as they are going through this, this engineering loop here with respect to improving the system design in, to, in order to meet the requirements. So it's important for that cyber testing informs the engineering the remediation that should happen, the prioritization of what to remediate, what to mitigate, um, any maintenance that has to be performed. You know, how are we going to know that our system's being attacked? We need some sort of maintenance training, you know, that says when you see this, do that, or when you update the, the software, you know, reset these configurations. Um, these cyber tests should inform sustainment and defender processes. So 
lots to think about. And now I think I'm turning it over to Nilo. Thanks, Sarah. All right, so we're, uh, what we're going to do now is talk about cyber testing, uh, the planning of specific executions of, of specific cyber test events. Uh, so go ahead, Sarah. So this table is a summary of the table that's in our cyber dotum. You can see here that there are six topics here. The first three are pretty common to all test plans, uh, but they do have a cyber spin in them. So system, for example, talks about the architecture of the system, right? Test, test environment talks about the condu uh, conditions, assumptions, limitations, constraints, uh, and also describing the cyber environment of the system. Uh, time and resources, pretty self-explanatory. The next three are a little bit more um, related specifically to cyber testing. We need to capture cyber test activities, for example. Um, so this, this table here shows one row, but this is a pretty big row in our actual document. This includes reconnaissance activities, uh, penetration activities, uh, activities to verify previously found vulnerabilities, and how the test organizations will emulate the threats. We also, uh, jumping up a row, we also want to talk about vulnerability tracking and retesting. We want to talk about tracking about uh, tracking the vulnerabilities. How are they going to use results from previous tests to, to identify vulnerabilities? Uh, how are they going to measure the severity of those vulnerabilities? Um, and then on the last row here, we want to talk about defender activities. We need to capture how during or after an attack, will the testers collect observations from um, from the cyber defenders? This could be these cyber defenders could be war fighters, the people equipped with the systems, operators, uh, cyber defenders. They could be CSSPs, right? And we just want to make sure that we are tracking them across the the process of detection, prevention, mitigation, response, response, and recovery. Um, a lot of these plans will only talk to part of this. So for example, DT test events may only conduct a penetration test on earlier lab environments, whereas OT tests will conduct a test on perhaps the entire system or a large subset of the system in a realistic environment with trained operators or cyber defenders. So there, in the dotum, there's a lot of text in these uh, sections, but it is not expected that every single test plan will cover every single item in that um, table. Go ahead, Sarah. Uh, like I was stating before, uh, our figure captures five rows that we'll we'll dive a little bit deeper into. Um, I will start with the small little orange faded row called security verification testing. These are automated continuous and manual testing that uh, tend to be the kind of the RMF's compliance, compliance verification, security control assessments. These could be static uh, a, a, a application security testing or dynamic application security testing. These could be software composition analysis. These are basically a lot of tests that could occur earlier in the software code development to ensure that the software is um, free or at a lower risk of some of the easier to catch vulnerabilities. Uh, hopefully this information flows up to the DT and OT teams so that we can test vulnerabilities that may impact the mission further if, uh, if they're not captured uh, during development. Um, no, I will note that these security verification tests aren't usually conducted by the DT or OT test teams. They're usually conducted by the contractor. Um, the other thing um, I want to talk about is that the other four rows we'll dive a little bit deeper into. So contractor testing, DT, LFT, and E, and OT, and E. Um, a goal of all of the testing here is to inform and uh, capture data and measurements for resilience and survivability of the system. We are trying our tests uh, at any point are trying to determine the access to the vulnerabilities, system exposures, and points of penetration, right? So we're trying to figure out where we're vulnerable, how could we be exploited, and then also we're trying to figure out once we are exploited, what what uh, what happens to the mission, right? And these are going to occur from the component level and up, right? So if there's a critical component that the um, that the IDSK identifies early on, then there could be a contractor test that con is conducted early on to, to verify that that system is uh, secure. The last thing I want to talk about is that we want to iterate uh, this process. Previous test events and previous decisions will inform the need for future testing. So if uh, if there are previous test results that are 
perhaps it's negative, then we might need to conduct additional testing. Or if a new threat profile comes out, there are various reasons why we would iterate through the process. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, I think this is me. So I'm going to cover both contractor and government cyber DT. Um, so it is much more than vulnerability scans. This is um, a sore point for me because over my seven years, I've struggled to get programs to understand that the, the threat is relevant and you need to look at it earlier than waiting till operational test where it's going to be potentially impossible to address the problem that you identify. So the whole point of cyber developmental test is to find problems, fix them if they're bad, and then test and verify that you did fix what was what was not good. So identify and mitigate risks. Identify engineering technical issues. Measure the specified requirements for the system capabilities for prevent, mitigate, recover, and adapt. That's a big part that I'm really trying to focus programs on is what are you measuring in tests? Don't just count vulnerabilities. Actually go and tell me what you're going to measure. How well do you prevent, mitigate, and recover or adapt? Then finally, uh, you need to verify that your products, what you're getting from the contractor, are compliant with the contractual and the technical requirements, including the STIGs and um, any exposures within the known national vulnerability database. So you, you're, you're going to look at all of that, and you're going to do that through iteratively using contractor cyber testing. So your contract needs to require that the contractors are measuring and reporting on these requirements early enough so that you can, you the program can respond and recover. Um, mitigate, remediate, you know, prioritize, figure out what needs to be fixed. And then when the when the product is delivered to the government, at whatever point you're getting the first, you know, delivery from a contractor and follow on deliveries, there should be a consideration for, have you delivered me a system that today is at meeting the requirements I need it to meet? You know, are there any exploitable vulnerabilities in my system or inability to meet the requirements as specified right when I first get it? And if not, then the contract has to support some sort of a get well plan, if you will. If they, however, on the other hand, if, the, if they do meet that, that's an opportunity to um, award the contractor, a, you know, a, an incentive. So if they are able to deliver a system that the government, when they do their acceptance testing, finds no mission impacting vulnerabilities or no mission, you know, any requirements that aren't being met, then, you know, they should get a bonus for that, some sort of an incentive award. And then finally, government cyber developmental test. This will focus on the components, the subsystems, prototypes, and any all the developmental systems, right, as they're going on and getting matured, eventually going to be moving into operational tests. Again, trying to find and fix. So the contract has to support that remediation and that mitigation. And the system security engineers are a big part of these, the looking at these results and understanding them with the testers. So we're trying to focus on multiple of the test events on all of the critical components as you build up the system. All right, over to you. Okay, I was answering a chat question. Uh, so there's a question about uh, for software intensive systems, how do you see cyber t &E integrating with software t &E? And will okay, the new guidance address that? Yeah, so so we are going to write a uh, appendix in the Cybertini campaigning guide that'll integrate software factory processes better into Cybertini. This is going to be a new section, uh, so it'll, it'll be matured further as we actually execute these processes a little bit better. But for now, we are going to write some guidance uh, based off of some research that our teams have done uh, and a few pilots that will um, carry this uh, forward into the software Tini realm and, and hopefully integrate those two two worlds a little bit better. Okay. So back to the slide, cyber operational tests and evaluation. So I'll talk about this now, go ahead. Um, so you can see there's a lot of text here. What I like to talk about with operational te tests and evaluation is uh, what I like to call three sufficiencies. Um, ot &E has to be conducted on one, uh, a production representative system, uh, two, with operationally representative users, and three, in an operationally representative environment. So for the cyberspace domain, this means that our cyber defenders 
need to be a part of this test. So basically, in addition, in, in addition to those three things, so we need to have a system that's ready to, to field, right? We need to have people that are trained to use that system. And we need to put that system in a place that is representative. Lastly, we need the cyber defenders as part of that testing. It's, it's, it's crucial for us to know how those systems respond and recover from cyber attacks. Uh, many tests that we currently see in operational testing uh, do not cover this currently. So, for example, we need to, to assess our co-op plans if we can, right? Determine the length of time it takes for the system to return to a nominal state. Uh, you can see on the second paragraph here uh, that we're trying to integrate cyber ot &E more with the larger t &E efforts. So we note that cyber ot &E is part of larger test events like the operational assessment or the initial operational test and evaluation or follow on test and evaluation. Uh, and then lastly, like I said, we are trying to, to, to make sure that the cyber testing for operational test is meets those three sufficiencies. Again, production representative system, operationally representative users, operationally representative environment. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, a key goal of cyber ot &E, and really the end goal of it is to determine mission impact from cyber effects. So our red teams will exploit the system and determine how much damage they can do, right? And our cyber defenders are going to determine how they can recover from that damage. This is very crucial for our testing, like I said in the last slide. The OT&E the OT &E team assesses all of that as part of our overarching survivability, suitability, and effectiveness assessment. Um, and so, but, but they lean on everything that has come before them, all the security verification testing, all the DT testing, right? So that's also crucial that that occurs, right? So because Sarah and I have seen many times that these DT tests aren't being conducted. We're hoping that with the guidance of developing the cyber working group, analyzing the requirements, going through the MBC array that you can kind of walk through the process and, and scope testing throughout uh, so that this testing here at the end that that OT&E typically conducts um, is not the is not the is not the first place where we see some of these problems. Go ahead, Sarah. Again, I, I keep hammering this home, but uh, we want to make sure that we are capturing what the users and defenders will do on OT&E. So in dt &E, there's more of a focus on how the system will prevent, mitigate, and recover from actions. But in operational test, we have to bring the person in as part of the suitability assessment. So there's, there's a part of it where it doesn't matter if the system can defend perfectly if the operator has no idea what to do when he gets an alert, right? Or if he gets an alert and he mis misattributes it or something like that, that all of that, the human, the human interfacing with the system really matters. And that, that's where training is critical, making sure the right people are here in the test. Um, all of that, very important to do. Uh, and then lastly, wait, go back real quick. The threat, we wanna make sure that we're emulating a real threat. So our red teams are trained to, to emulate the real threats um, and, they, and they do that to show to people at the end of the day, hey, this is what a real threat could do to our system. And this is how your cyber defenders reacted to the system. There are there could be potentially some problems here. We are not we are not ready. So we need to we need to patch this up. And that's the, really the end goal of cyber. Okay, go ahead. All right, so now I'm gonna talk to this newer concept, which is cyber live fire. Um, and I will state that this is new and we're still working on this uh, internally in dot &E, but go ahead. So our current law notes that we need to emulate realistic survivability testing. So that law right there. Um, this concept from our perspective, dot and &E's perspective includes both kinetic and non-kinetic effects. So the idea is that most programs that are already conducting live fire test and evaluation will have a live fire t &E working group that is also subservient to the t &E whippet. And the idea here is that the SIWIG and the live fire working groups must coordinate together to conduct what is called the mission-based risk assessment. Um, the mission-based cyber risk assessment will feed into the mission-based risk assessment. And this, this overarching process here is this process of making sure that cyber live fire meets, uh, can meet some of the objectives of the overarching live fire test team uh, in the non-kinetic space. Um, the idea there is that, live, like I said, live fire will further scope that testing, 
uh, especially when cyber tests can affect the, the physical domain, right? So we're trying to tie these domains closer together. We're trying to kind of bring it all together into one large survivability assessment, if you will, where we talk about all domains of, of survivability. Additionally, another thing that these cyber live fire tests could be is if we test the uh, a cyber cyber effects on a full up production representative system similar to what is called a full up system level test in live fire and we test it against that and see how the actual entire system handles it and it, it may roll up and include destructive testing if for cyber teeny it might be the the ultimate capstone for testing it is similar to what already exists with the, with regards to the adversarial assessment and so there um, there is some terminology that is similar here. Um, and uh, like I said, we are still working together with Arnie and internally to make sure that we have this concept worked out, uh, but it will be in our companion guide as uh, further fleshed out with this information. We are developing several pilots now, like for example, that MBRA process, mission-based risk assessment process we're trying to, to pilot out. And we're also piloting out a full up, a fusel cyber test event within the um, joint live fire program. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, so last thing here, reporting. Uh, these are the common concepts that need to be reported out across the Cybertini program. Note that I didn't state documents. So again, a given test report might not have all of this information in it. It will be various test reports could have various test points. Uh, so example, there could be a test that or an assessment that's done just on the supply chain, right? It only talks about the supply chain. Uh, others could focus on electromagnetic spectrum testing. Um, our older language, the CVPAs and CVI, CVIs focused on the rows in the center, vulnerability identification and exposure identification. Um, while the AAs and ACDTs focused on operational mission effects and the prevent, mitigate, recover steps. Um, so there's still there's still an expectation that there are separate types of test events that are occurring that will report out separate pieces of this process. But throughout this process of cyber t &E, you are capturing this information for your program so that we can identify at the end of the day, where are we vulnerable and when we are vulnerable, what does that do to our mission? Uh, Nila, we have a question about when we the timeline for these updated documents to be formally released um, good, we are shooting for this year <laughs> uh, right now we are informally working through comments with the services on the manual and the companion guide is in parallel trying to be keep up i guess is what i would say so that's that and then the other question was are you including in your test manual the development of metrics to collect false positives, false negatives when you're assessing alerts and warnings to an operator. That might be a companion guide topic, not necessarily the manual level, because you know that's a little bit more um, deeper in technically into the content than the manual is intended to go. Right. So again, there's two there's two levels. The policy is the DODM, the Department of Defense manual, right? And that's that is right now currently in the uh, WHS issuances portal. That's moving along, but we do have a guidance, the Cybertini Companion Guide, which will capture a lot of best practices, a lot of the the, the text from the older uh, companion the cybersecurity guidebook that um, Sarah had written in the past. Um, uh that we published in the past. I don't want to say I wrote the whole darn thing, but I you, wrote a lot you, of it. You wrote it in spirit. <laughs> I wrote well, some of it. I did write. Um, and when are we releasing the policy on Cyber Live Fire? At the same time. So the Cyber Live Fire policy is is in the 89. The 89 requires Live Fire on everything. And then the cyber portion of it is in the manual. All right. All right. So, um, Thank you for bearing with us. We've spent a long time discussing where we're going in cyber t &E. um, Like I stated earlier, we're trying to make sure that this process is iterative, recursive. It feeds back on itself. We need to start by understanding our cyber requirements, <laughs> right? We need to, they need to be measurable, testable, meaningful, achievable, right? Uh, we start with those, maybe those CSAs from the joint um, 
from the J6, right, that has the 10 CSAs, and then we break those down into actual requirements. Um, then we need to apply our system threat analysis, and we need to uh, identify where what our what our threats are, and we need to identify our attack surface of these systems. Then, as we start designing the system, we've got to decompose the mission, map it to the system, and then find out where are we, where are the critical components, where are the components that we need to test. That's that's where we take the that that decomposition. We take that and we actually design tests to inform um, the the vulnerability and exposure and the exploitation of these systems, uh, and then we use that information to inform remediation, mitigation, and maintenance of our of our of our systems um, at every level, right? Subcomponent all the way up to system of system. We're hoping to do that through the mission-based cyber risk assessment process. That kind of uh, most of that stuff that I highlighted there, uh, and then lastly, we're trying to use all the automated testing that will come before in some of the uh, more mature processes that you're hearing about, like in software factories, where the software factory kind of does a lot of the security scanning ahead of time. We are trying to pull that information um, forward so that that will help us scope our testing as well. So. Lastly, just want to hammer home, we're trying to make this more data driven. So a lot of that data flows back into that that large enterprise data, data repository, or maybe not enterprise, but at least program level data data repository so that people who work on that program can conduct their analysis, their assessments, and their reports uh, at any moment in time in an ideal world. We're, we know we're not quite there yet, but that's where we want to go in, in our policy and in our guidance is, create a place where this this data sits within programs and then use that use that information to help the teeny community drive decision making uh, with relevant and timely access to test reports and then lastly Sarah here has this little catch catch all here that says don't just catch our vulnerabilities don't count them right measure performance and capabilities in contested cyberspace and when we're hoping that we can do that from the beginning as the program, matures out their requirements, we kind of come in and state, hey, these look at these things, right? Come into these things, put these in, put this text in your contract. Um, and, and then we follow along for the ride uh, as the program is developed to to make sure that we are measuring performance and capabilities across the, the life cycle. So uh, with that, Sarah, do you have any last words? I do not have any last words. You did fantastic as always. Um, but we will open the floor up for any other questions we didn't answer. If we missed your question in chat, apologies, you can ask it again, or maybe Phil can guide us on that. Um, and we, I agree, Mike Lilienthal, we do want to be clear and jargon free. That's part of the, just call it cyber test and evaluation perspective and, and not being too overly sensitive about what's cooperative, what's adversarial. Um, so I see a question, are there additional resources for live fire cyber t &E? So there is a, a pilot going on for live fire cyber t &E, a couple of them at NAVAIR and in the Air Force. The, there will be pr products produced on their processes from doing those, and so we will make those available when we can. Um, I hope that's, I know that's not the answer you necessarily wanted. Phil, any other questions we missed? Um, first and foremost, uh, thank you for your time and your participation. Uh, this was actually the last of a three part webinar series um, that was kind of mentioned previously. Um, today was a little unique because we did have two presenters. Uh, we did have the ability to kind of monitor the chat and answer questions um, as they go. Um, so I don't really see anything that was outstanding from the chat. Uh, one of the questions that I did receive privately to, to one of the hosts in the chat was, will the transcript of the chat be available? Um, that is something that we normally do not do, but uh, since today we did have the unique experience of uh, a lot of interaction within the chat, I think that will be helpful for all of our members. So I believe WebEx does have that fun functionality to export uh, the chat. Um, if not, then you know, um, at the bare minimum, we can just do a, a copy and paste to make sure everybody has the availability. Um, and obviously those who were dialed in over, over the phone uh, wouldn't be able to see the chat. So I think that'll be beneficial for uh, everybody who's presenting. So um, be on the lookout for that. We'll, we'll send that following uh, following up with the email so everybody can uh, 
benefit from the answers uh, that we did see in the chat. I know there were a lot of questions about whether or not um, this will be recorded. This will be recorded. Uh, that recording will be uploaded to the CSI web webpage um, within a within a day or two. Uh, the slides are up there now as well. Um, so please check back for that. Um, I do want to tackle. I do want to yeah, tackle uh, a couple questions going by here. Defense business systems are not exempt from cyber live fire tests, to the best of my knowledge. Nilo. Uh, Lots of live fire questions. <laughs> yeah, so so my understanding of of our live fire law, right, is that if we consider a system to if we consider a system to be vulnerable in the cyberspace domain, then in quotes, live fire applies, right? But this is not it's non kinetic live fire. So it's so this is why where there's still some there's still some discussions, right, on how we're trying to to determine this. But but the the, the there there is an argument to be made that potentially what cyber DT and OT already does is cyber live fire, right? Um, it's just that the terminology is sw swapped around. So there's um, there's definitely some translation that we have to do between the live fire community and the cyber cyber community, cyber test and evaluation community here. And that that could potentially be all that the differences between cyber DT, cyber OT and um, and cyber live fire is is a communication uh, mapping back to the um, overarching live fire process. But to the larger question of is is cyber live fire applicable? It, it is because the system will be vulnerable in the cyberspace domain. Over. Yeah, that's a great that's a great answer. Um, and then I think we have another question here. Um, challenges in the past with data with sharing data due to classification of some results have been discussed. Have there been discussions about streamlining processes or distilling info to get to help get relevant information? to contractors engineers there are always conversations around that thank you for that question derek uh, it is a known challenge and we are i was just in a, a you know a round table this morning where that came up again it comes up every time we we know that's a challenge one of the things tr the test resource management center is working on is how to measure and share test data that would be another useful thing i think for for programs to get other programs test data without knowing which program it's for from, maybe how can we reuse information? So there's we have a lot of work to do, absolutely. And how do these principles get T and E principles get incorporated into operational exercises? DOT and E conducts the. Go ahead, Nilo Cap. Okay. Cap yes. Command. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Our cybersecurity assessment program, Cap conducts exercise, uh, supports exercise assessments for all the combatant commands already. So when CAP is uh, brought into one of those exercise assessments, they do already bring a lot of the operational test expectations from um, from the OT&E side here at, at DOT&E and pull that forward into the exercise assessments. And then once they do that, so they support the building of the blue team and the red team cells, the bl blue and red cells, uh, they bring the cyber threats and then they, they execute the testing and then they report that back to you know back to the combatant command and back to our programs right so that information can flow backwards if a system was in that exercise right that they they will report back to the the program office and state hey your system did this in this exercise so we do kind of already we do kind of already do that there's definitely more there's always more we could do to to, to pull that forward um but that is that is definitely already something the otini is trying to do right now Okay, I guess I'm not seeing any more questions. Did I stop sharing? I think I did. So I'm not sure anymore, am I? <laughs> I can't even tell. I still see the question slide. Oh, okay. So it doesn't let me stop sharing. Let's stop share. There it is. Okay. All right. So Phil, thank you very much for this opportunity. We uh, would we welcome the opportunity to travel around to your program offices or your program executive offices or whoever you need us to. Uh, Nilo and I want to help, you know, people understand the the policy and the guidance and be successful in executing. Definitely, thank you very much for your time and your participation. Uh, like I said, the recording of this presentation will be up on the CSI website um, within a, within a day or two. If you go to the announcement, you can find the slides now. I will be sending an email. Um, with the very least a copy and paste of the Q&A in the chat from today, uh, that transcript since um, 
it was so interactive today. Um, and I appreciate your time. Hopefully we see everyone on our, our next webinar, which I believe is scheduled for July 12th. Uh, we have the folks from NIST doing an overview of risk management framework. Um, but with that said, we'll sign off for today. Thank you very much.